All right, cool. I'm gonna get started. So hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me today um, for our Google Cloud Tools talk today. Hope you all have been having a good time hacking and have hopefully learned something new already. My name is Andrea, and you may have seen me earlier giving the Firebase talk. Um, I'm actually a software engineer on Firebase in our New York City office. And I don't actually really work on Google Cloud, although Firebase is technically part of it. So I've seen this presentation that I'm about to give a few times, and I've helped students debug through various Google Cloud issues at other hackathons. So hopefully you'll all find this helpful and useful. Um, at any point in time, if you have questions, feel free to ping in the chat. Um, and then whenever I guess there's a break, um, I'll take a look at the questions and answer them. So here's an overview of where we're headed today. After a quick intro to cloud computing and Google Cloud, we'll dive into key products to host your code. That's going to be followed by an intro to using Google APIs, a deep dive into our ML APIs, some other APIs to consider, and finally a wrap up. We'll demo a few things along the way with code samples, and don't worry about copying the code down. I'll send out a PDF of this entire talk after it ends, so you have the resources that we talk about here today. So first, let's talk a bit about cloud computing and Google Cloud. What is cloud computing? Cloud computing usually means different things to different people, but at its core, it's really about getting things done with someone else's computers. So in the case of Google Cloud, well, you're basically using Google's computers and resources to help you get things done. The industry typically defines three cloud computing service levels to categorize similar services. Those levels are software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. There's a lot of different products and vendors at each level, as it's a, quite a vibrant ecosystem with many choices. Google's not the only one that does all these things. You'll probably see big names here that you recognize, as well as some smaller ones, and they all provide a wide variety of services. The cloud is, after all, an ecosystem that's growing every day. Now, let's dig into each service level. At the top is one of the most well-known service levels, software as a service, the outsourcing of services. This is where you're using services that are, for the most part, only accessible from a web browser or a mobile client. You don't want to run your own email servers. Most of us don't. And that's why we all sign up for Gmail, Yahoo Mail, or Hotmail, although probably out of that list, only one is really used that much. So when we use those, we're outsourcing our email service to Google, Yahoo, or Microsoft, or whoever's making that email service. What about managing all your customers from anywhere globally? That's what Salesforce is all about. So you typically don't care about how these apps are built or what their technology stacks are. You only care that the apps work and are accessible when you need them. To many people, software as a service is everything they consider as cloud computing. This is a fair assessment if you're only a user of the cloud. As a developer, though, knowing about these other levels is quite important and useful. So skipping past the middle for now and dropping to the bottom of the stack, we've got infrastructure as a service. This is where you're outsourcing your hardware operations, including computing, storage, and networking. You rent virtual machines and big disks instead of buying and maintaining your own. Guess what happens when technology goes out of date? It's not your problem if that's great. You pay for the resources used, and your costs cover all the necessities like power, networking, and cooling. Keep in mind that while you have full control at the infrastructure level, you're responsible for everything between the hardware level layer and your app, meaning things like the operating system, the database server, the web server, load balancing, monitoring, reporting, upgrades, and patching. And you have to care because every app will need all of these things. The sweet spot is right in the middle with platform as a service. Unlike infrastructure, 
you don't have to worry about things that aren't directly related to your app that we just talked about, that long list of stuff about hardware and operating systems and web servers and all that. You only need to worry about your application code. And software as a service, we're using someone else's web app. This is your web app. And the term web app here is flexible too, as your code can just as easily serve as the backend for a mobile client. With those additional concerns like operating system and databases taken care of, you can really just focus on building your app and then uploading your code. Platform as a service systems like Google App Engine take care of the rest. However, like with most layered systems, there's always some gray area in between, and the cloud is really no exception. So for example, let's take a look at the level between infrastructure and platform as a service. You see products that are like infrastructure, but they're more than just raw storage or compute. Most appear to be data services, for example, and databases, querying, and analysis tools. However, compared to platform as a service, these aren't really full-blown platform systems that allow you to build apps on. Some would call it Slayer databases as a service, but if you look really carefully, they're not actually all databases. Similarly, between software as a service and platform as a service, you've got products which are platforms for you to build and host apps with, but they aren't pure platform as a service systems. Instead, they're tied to software as a system data and systems. For example, Google, Google Apps Script relies on Google Apps Data or other Google services, and Salesforce one slash force.com lets you build apps that leverage your Salesforce data. So all of that stuff, what did we just learn? Well, outside of the gray areas, there are three primary cloud service levels, each with different responsibilities for the user as well as the cloud vendor. With software as a system here on the very right in this yellow box, you're outsourcing services. You're responsible for nothing outside of using those apps in any personal settings. Oops. The platform as a service level gives you a place to host your apps, meaning you're responsible for the code and the data for those apps. At some point, you'll realize that you use platform as a service systems to create and host service as a system apps. At the infrastructure as a service level, you're, lo at, uh, yeah, you're looking at not just the apps and their data, but also everything from the hardware layer and up, like the operating system, the, data, the database server, the web server, and the runtime environment. And way off the screen to the left is where you're not using cloud at all, meaning you're responsible for everything including managing your own data centers and outdated equipment. That's the one trick with hardware. It's pretty much obsolete the day you bought it, right? What if we could take advantage of the kind of scale and innovation that's behind Google services before your big data? This is where the Google Cloud Platform steps in, enabling you to take your app to the power of Google. Some people think Google Cloud and Google Cloud Platform are the same, but they're not. Look, even the icons are different. Think of Google Cloud as an organization producing two large and discrete product groups made up of both GCP and G Suite. You know, G Suite being Gmail, Google Drive, Calendar, Docs, Sheets, Slides. And GCP lets your apps use our infrastructure like virtual machines, big disk, machine learning, networking, security, and serverless. And while it's clear that Google Cloud Platform is for developers, behind each G Suite tool that you use, there's actually also an API. So we offer products at each service level. However, while Google Apps and Google Apps Scripts are great cloud products, the Google Cloud Platform itself serves only at the platform and infrastructure levels. Think about it this way. Typically, you use Google Apps. In contrast, you host your apps using the Google Cloud Platform, and your users use your app. The Google Cloud Platform offers a mix of compute, storage, network, and application services whose purpose is to let you build and host great apps where you pick and choose which services you want to use. 
is an extension of our internal infrastructure and services shared with you, giving you the same power and scalability that runs services like Google Search, YouTube, and Gmail. So what is Google Cloud Platform or GCP? GCP lets you host and run code like web apps, mobile backends, web services and containers, store and analyze data, and much more, all on Google's highly scalable and reliable computing infrastructure. Essentially, GCP is a suite of developer tools that help us build amazing apps using Google's computing power. They use the same technology that powers Google's own products like Search, Gmail, and Google Translate. Here's just a small sampling of Google Cloud products. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Our products are broken up into categories like compute, big data, machine learning, and storage and databases. We'd be here for several days if I were to talk about all of our products. So we're just going to focus on these today, which I'll cover during the rest of this talk. So now that we've covered a bit about what cloud computing and Google Cloud are, let's talk about hosting code on GCP serverless and using platform as a service. Google Compute Engine lets you configure virtual machines of all shapes and sizes from very small to very big. Plus, Google Cloud Storage lets you store data-like blobs. Both Google Compute Engine and Google Cloud Storage allow you to be serverless. What does that actually mean? It's a misnomer, actually, because there are a lot of there are real servers, just not your servers. By using these products, you can focus on writing code and solving business problems instead of spending time to maintain your own servers. Aside from that, why be serverless? That's the fastest growing segment of cloud per analyst research for good reason. If you go viral, it'll auto scale for you. And if you don't and your code isn't running on these servers, great, you're not paying a dime. If you ran your own servers though, you'd always be paying because, well, you're running your own servers and that costs money. Here's a harder question though. Today's focus is on serverless compute like Google App Engine, Google Cloud Functions, and Google Apps Script. Other non-compute data processing like BigQuery, Cloud Machine Learning Engine, Google Cloud Storage, and Cloud Firestore are also considered GCP serverless in that they, they can do processing without provisioning VMs. So let's talk a bit about App Engine. Say you have a great app idea, but you don't want to provision your own VMs nor deal with your own web servers, load balancing, auto scaling, nor database servers. With Google App Engine, you don't need to focus on any of those issues. You just upload your code and it will take care of the rest. It's quite flexible as you can use any framework, library, or binary. It takes some time to deploy, but it's good for constant usage apps. To use App Engine for a Pyth or for a Flask app, this is all you have to do. In your app.yaml, tell it that you need to use Python 3.7 or whatever version of Python you're using. In your main.py, add your routes and whatever you want to return when it lands on that route. In this case, we're making a hello world app. In your requirements.txt, tell it to use Flask. All you have to do now is download the Google Cloud CLI and deploy with gcloud app deploy. After that's done, you go to your URL to see your deployed app. That's all done. And just as a reminder, don't worry about writing all of this stuff down or taking an image of it or whatever. I will send you all the presentation in PDF format afterward. Uh, here's a link to the App Engine tutorial for Flask, which is in Python. It's also available for Java, Node, PHP, Go, and Ruby. There's also another product to help you run code. In the case of App Engine, it's used to run your entire app. What well, if you don't have the entire app or you don't want to put your entire app into App Engine and you just want to deploy small microservices or RPCs online and globally? That's what Google Cloud Functions is used for. And there's a Firebase version for mobile apps, as I talked about earlier in the Firebase talk. If you missed my render of functions earlier, it basically allows you to run snippets of backend code on the cloud. And it's event-driven, meaning it's triggered by HTTP or back ground events 
like from cloud storage, various Firebase products, etc. It also auto scales and is highly available. Here's a tutorial for Google Cloud Functions and Python, and it's also available in Node and Go. So now that we've talked about how to host your code, let's talk about the different APIs available for use. As a refresher on how APIs in general fit into the typical client server model, your application will first make a request to the API that you want to use. And you have to pass it either an OAuth2 token or an API key to identify your app. You'll be able to find these API keys or OAuth tokens once you sign up to use the API, whether the API is from Google or not. The request is received by whatever Google Cloud service you're calling. And when it receives your app's request, it'll process some data and return a response back to your app. In working with Google, Google's APIs, the hub of all your activity is in the Cloud Console, which you can quickly access at console.cloud.google.com. It's where you manage all of your apps, which are called projects. You can access GCP tools that you're using, manage your billing and collaborators, or go to the API manager. By the way, this UI does change from time to time, so it may not look exactly like this. The API Manager, also known as the Dev Console, has three tabs. You can go straight to the API Manager at console.developers.google.com. The first tab here on the dashboard to the left here is to see stats on your app, like how much traffic you're getting, the number of errors it's generating, and how fast it responds to users. The second tab is to enable or disable which APIs to use. None of the G Suite APIs are on by default, so pick and choose the ones you want to toggle on and off. Finally, the last tab is to create credentials like the API keys and OAuth clients that we talked about on the last slide. To get more information on using the Dev Console, the link here is a video providing more details. So now we get to some pretty fun machine learning tools where we'll talk about for accessing some AI and machine learning with various APIs. So how many of you know how to recognize the difference between a puppy and a muffin? You've probably got a bunch of rules in your head, like eyes and ears and fur means a puppy, while something shaped like a mountain and a rubber is a muffin. OK, now let's ask again, puppy or muffin? That was a total bait and switch with the last slide, wasn't it? In reality, sometimes it's not so easy. What about a rule of having eyes? Well, it got messed up by the blueberries and the muffins. This shows that using hard-coded rules only goes so far in helping to classify images. Just like how people learn things through both rules and experience, machine learning allows you to learn from rules plus experience. Here's a nice diagram showing how machine learning differs from classical programming. With classical programming, you take data and rules as input and the outputs answers. With machine learning, you actually start with data and answers. This is your training material and is used to generate rules that you can make that you can use to make predictions for future pieces of test data. Basically, you can use past data to learn patterns that will help you evaluate new data. So now diving up bit into machine learning. First, there's a training phase where lots of answers and data get pumped into our machine learning code, which eventually builds a set of rules or a model. So for example, with our puppy and muffin example, we will say, OK, here's, here's some data. right? So we would give it an image of a, of a puppy and tell it the answer, which is puppy. We would do that a lot of times. And hopefully, by the end of that, It'll produce a rule and model knowing, OK, this is what a puppy is. In the next phase, which is the inference phase, some new data gets passed through our uh, data from the training phase and gives a prediction, hopefully a correct one. So once we have built that model that knows, OK, this is what a puppy is, 
Hopefully, when we give it a new image of a puppy, it'll be able to predict that it's a puppy and not a muffin. An example of machine learning at Google is the Google Translate app. With this app, you can get instant in-app translation of street signs captured by your camera. It will actually transpose the translated text directly onto your screen. Accurate translation is a pretty challenging problem, but with machine learning, Google Translate can do this really well. Machine learning is used a lot for Google products. Another example of machine learning is Google Photos. A really cool feature of that app is searching by keyword, which lets, which lets you search for photos using keywords like dog or Hawaii. Google Photos uses computer vision technology to label different photos based on what Google's machine learning model thinks is going on in each photo. After training on billions of images, the app's predictive model allows you to search for images using keywords without having to manually label them all. So earlier, we talked about how a general theme of cloud computing is using someone else's computing resources to get things done. One way that Google shares its machine learning capabilities with developers is through the machine learning APIs. Basically, with the APIs, the training aspect of machine learning, which is the part requiring analysis of data and building the predictive models, that part has already been completed by Google, allowing you to jump straight to the predict phase where you give the API new data and get predictions. So here's some Google Cloud ML APIs. So we have vision, video intelligence, search, natural language, and translate. And we'll walk through these together. Uh, I see a question that says, are the rules and model just utilized to make predictions? Yes. Um, yeah, they are. All right, I'm going to continue on. So first, we'll talk a little bit about the Cloud Vision API, which lets developers understand what an image is. Cloud Vision can identify and detect objects and labels, text and OCR, landmarks, logos, facial features, products, and so on. Here's a code sample of OCR, which detects and extracts text from an image. We'll first import the Vision API and provide it with an image URL. In this case, we gave it one from Cloud Storage. We'll get the Vision client and feed it the image, and we'll ask the Vision API to detect the text in the image. When the API returns the response, we will loop through the return text and print it out along with the vertices of the image that the text is for. So here, if we run our text detect Python script with this image, it'll return us the bounds for the entire caution sign along with the text. It'll also break down the different words and where those vertices are in the image, as you can see here. Here's an example of image analysis and metadata extraction. Again, we import the Vision API and give it some image to the Vision API. This time, we're trying to get label and face detection. So we'll call those functions and print out the description of what the API returned back to us, as well as how confident we are, or how confident it is in what it returned. Running the code from the previous slide, this is what gets printed out. We see here that there are these labels order from most confident to least confident. And we see labels such as sitting, interior design, and so on. It also does some facial feature detection. It returns back the likelihood of these sentiments. All emotions seem very unlikely aside from joy, which seems very likely. And if we look at the image here, it seems that the predictions that it has made is pretty accurate. Next, we'll talk about the Cloud Natural Language API, which reveals the structure and meaning of text. It can tell the general sentiment of the text, classify the content, extract entities, and do some syntactical structure analysis. It's also multilingual. So here's a code example. We'll import the Natural Language API and feed it some text. 
will then call it to analyze the sentiment of the text as well as classify the text. So we gave it this text. Google headquartered in Mountain View unveiled the new Android phone at the Consumer Electronics Show. Sundar Pichai said in his keynote that users love their new Android phones. The sentiment got a score of 0 0.3 with a magnitude of 0 0.6. So here it's looking for words in the text that portray some sentiment. And in this case, I probably saw one word, love. The word is quite strong, so the magnitude is high with 0 0.6. If I said users liked their new Android phones instead of users loved their new Android phones, the magnitude would have gone down because the word like is not as strong of a word as love. And the score would have stayed the same because there's still only one word that indicates some sentiment. If we used more sentiment words, the sentiment score would become higher and the magnitude would change according to how strong those uh, sentiment words are. For categories, it's quite confident that the text is about internet and telecom with a confidence score of 0 0.76. Computers and electronics seem pretty high too, and news follows right after that. Cloud speech is another API, and it lets you convert speech to text and vice versa. We'll give it some text, and we can tell it what voice to use. In this case, we'll give it a female US English voice, and the input will be some text. Let's call the API and store the resulting file into a text.wab file. To transcribe words from an audio file, we'll tell it what language it's in, and then call the API. If we make the program say this phrase, and then transcribe that, we get this transcript with a 92% confidence score. The words are pretty much all correct, but it's missing some capitalization and punctuation. Next, we have the Cloud Translation API, which translates arbitrary strings into any of the supported languages. So that's some of Google Cloud's machine learning APIs. Let's talk about some other APIs that might be useful. Most, if not all, of your apps will need some sort of database. Cloud Firestore is Google Cloud's product that does that. And it's a no SQL database that stores data as collections and documents. I talked about this in great detail in the Firebase talk, so I'm going to spare you the details of it now. If you need a refresher, you can check out the documentation here, or you can look at the Firebase presentation slides. Next, we have BigQuery, which lets you store and analyze data. It's fast, highly scalable, and it can run SQL queries across multi terabytes of data really, really, really quickly. So let's query some Shakespeare words. We import the BigQuery API and tell it to select the most common Shakespeare words. There are many public data sets that are imported into BigQuery already so we can directly query from there. We use an existing public data set here, which has Shakespeare samples. And let's see what it gives us when we run this code. It produces the word as well as the count. And on the right here, you can see an example of what that looks like in the Google Cloud Console. The most common words are the, and, I, to, of, and so on. Here's some information on the public data sets. There's BigQuery public data sets, and you can run queries right inside of BigQuery. There's other public data sets as well, including ones for COVID-19, life sciences, and healthcare. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about G Suite, particularly Google Drive. You all probably use some form of Google Drive, but did you know there's a Drive API? It allows developers to read write, control permissions and sharing, import and export files, and more. There's also the Sheets API, which gives you programmatic access to spreadsheets, meaning you can perform almost any action you can do from the web interface as a user, but with code instead. Why would you want to use the Sheets API, though? 
Well, you can use it if you have lots of data and you want to do some data visualization. You can also use it to make some customized reports or use data sheets as a data source. Here's some code on how to migrate SQL data to a sheet. First, we'll connect to a SQLite database and we'll execute a query. We take the results of that query and pass it to the Sheets API. After we import all of that data into a sheet, we can visualize the data. Here, we'll tell it what type of chart we want. In this case, we want a column chart. And we give it the starting cell and the ending cell for the data of our sheet, where we want to, where, and as well as where we want it to put the visualization on the sheet. And then we call the API to insert the chart. And there we have it on the right. Last but not least, there's the Maps platform. It includes the Maps API, where you can put in pictures of Google Maps for places that you care about for your app, but also do some routing for your map using the Routes API, as well as get information about different, about different places using the Places API. And as I mentioned in the beginning, Google Cloud has so, so, so many products that it's impossible to go through them all. Here are some other APIs and platforms that might be useful for you. So we talked about G Suite earlier um, and coding all the products in G Suite as opposed to using them yourself. We have Firebase, which I talked about earlier. Uh, there's Google Data Studio, Actions on Google Assistant Dialogflow, YouTube, of course, Google Maps, and Flutter. If you haven't heard of Flutter, it's a pretty cool mobile app framework that lets you code just once, but produces native Android, native iOS, and native web apps. I'm personally quite a fan of Flutter myself. And we'll quickly wrap up and give you a link of resources. And here they are. There's lots of documentation all around, and they're all quite detailed and do step-throughs of code examples. And that wraps up this talk. I hope it was helpful, and feel free to reach out to me. Um, if there's any questions, you can feel free to type them into the chat now, and I can uh, I can respond. Um, if not, my name is Andrea. Uh, if you forget that, I'll also be hanging out in the mentor chat and slot. So feel free to post any questions there that you have about Google Cloud or Firebase, um, and I'll get back to you there as well. Someone asked if they could see the resources again. Yes. I'll also be sending this out, um, like the entire slide deck. Um, I'll be posting it into Slack. So if you missed any part of it, you can go back through it yourself. And uh, like the PDF will have all of these links as well. Yeah, so that's the end.